Welcome to the BCS Women and SGAI AI Accelerator. Uh, this is a rerun of the intro talk and the aim of this talk is to give you a quick overview of what AI is and what people might mean when they use the term AI, finishing up with a fairly deep dive overview of machine learning um, without doing any sums. Um, I'm Hannah D and this is a quick talk about AI. Uh, before we start looking at what AI is, it's worth looking at some definitions. And this definition here from Kurzweil in 1990 appears at the start of pretty much every textbook I've ever read on AI. And it says that artificial intelligence is the art of creating machines that perform functions that require intelligence when they're performed by people. Um, when we look at this definition and start to unpick it, you realize that we're already talking about AI in terms of human intelligence. And this is something that comes up again and again when you look at AI from a more philosophical standpoint. And that is, we, us humans, are probably the only examples we have of an intelligence. And we're the model that all other in AI things are pretty much measured against. And if we look at the, the history of AI, the human and human ability is one of the things that we keep coming back to. Um, you can't do a talk on AI without mentioning Alan Turing because he's the first person who really considered the question of whether computers could think. Um, he wrote a paper in 1950 which is in the journal Mind and it's still a fantastic paper. I can thoroughly recommend looking at it, it's very readable. And what he looks at is says instead of thinking whether a computer whether ask, instead of asking the question whether a computer can think, he says let's Let's back off from that. Let's come up with a test. And if the computer passes this test, then we'll kind of have to say it's intelligent. And his test was based around the concept of conversation and the idea that if you could have a conversation with an artificially intelligent computer system and you couldn't tell whether you were talking to a computer or whether you were talking to a human, then you'd have to say that that computer could think. Um, Conversation, conversation and conversational ability is still some, some decades on one of the real challenges for AI and it's one of the places where we've seen a lot of progress in recent years as well. Um, also on this slide I have a photograph of, uh, not a photograph, a painting of Ada Lovelace, uh, partly because Ada Lovelace is awesome and partly because she actually looked at the concept of AI in a sense a little bit earlier than Turing and she considered um, questions about whether a computer could be creative and so on long before there was anything that even looked like a computer um, certainly before anything functioned like a computer. When we take, take a step back and look at AI as a field it's not one thing. Artificial intelligence is not a single entity, it's not a single subject Within the field of AI, we can break things down and there are people working on perception, both visual perception and auditory perception. There are people working on conversational agents and linguistic processing. There are people working on planning and how you take things and draw conclusions and move forwards from what you're doing. Um, actions, uh, particularly in concept of robotic, in context of robotics, are really major. And um, predictions and being able to link planning, prediction and action is a big way, the thing that's important in robotics. In Across pretty much all of AI, the job of categorising or labelling stuff is fairly important. So being able to tell what a thing is, being able to give it a name is a very important topic within AI. Um, and also learning is perhaps the hottest topic in AI, which is how you can take a computer system that looks at lots of examples of stuff, looks at lots of data, and then is able to draw conclusions from that data that enable it to deal better with future data. Um, thinking's in the middle, but thinking is kind of a nebulous concept. What is AI? Well, it's a machine that thinks. You need to kind of break thinking down a bit before you can talk about what AI is um, and how we're going to make computers do it. Um, one strange side effect of work in AI and computational thinking and so on is that quite often we discover that as soon as a computer solves a problem 
we decided that problem wasn't actually intelligent after all. Um, early on, very early on, people used to say that mathematics and logic were the key parts of uh, what made the human intelligent. And mathematics and logic are some of the first things that fell to the machines. Um, so we say, well, maybe doing logic isn't actually clever, because that's easy, right? Computers can do it. Then there's chess. Chess was seen as a very intellectual game, but computers can now beat all of us, I believe. Language, being able to take a sentence and, and parse it and work out what's going on, is something that seems slightly more intelligent, and that's something where we've had more progress recently. Vision, being able to perceive things, is a problem that computers find quite difficult, but humans see as not, maybe not intelligent after at all, after all. We sometimes don't think of our perception as being part of our intelligence, but as soon as you try and write a computer program that can do it, you realise that actually there's quite a lot hidden in our visual cortex. Self-driving cars um, incorporate lots of ideas from AI, from perception through to planning, through to classification and action, and quite often people think that these are just machines that behave on the road, um, like a robot would, and they're not intelligent, but there's a lot of AI going on inside your self-driving car. Um, Siri and other conversational agents from, uh, provide you with a means of interacting naturally with a computer, and people see these perhaps just as interfaces, different ways to talk to a computer, and they don't see that there's AI going on behind that, and actually that's quite intelligent. Being able to take a vocal signal, break it down into its constituent words, parse those sentences, and then work out how to answer the question involves quite a lot of stuff. And it's getting towards the conversational agents that Turing was talking about. I think if you've ever tried to talk to Siri for any length of time, you'll realize that it's not actually that clever. But it's getting there. It's really getting there. And then, in the future, what we see is things like robot surgeons and robots taking on more and more roles and AI becoming more and more embedded in what we do. And uh, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see things happening where artificial intelligence and artificial agents are taking our jobs and doing things that we just wouldn't even conceive of now. Um, whether we're at the Robocop stage yet or whether Robocop is in our near future um, this is a question that I'm going to try and skim over but there is a tension when you look at AI between people who are really looking forward to the idea of robots that can do really useful things and computer programs that can do really useful things um, whereas on the flip side there are, there's a lot of people bra branding stuff and talking about stuff as being AI when it actually isn't that clever um, there is uh, a lot of things that are called AI that are basically just questions about whether if statements in the um, sorry that that are basically simple decision trees and so on and whether decision trees and the idea that you can ask a lot of simple questions and end up with a complicated system um, actually count as AI or not is a is a big thing. Um, so what I want to do now is back off and ask the question, what do people really mean when they say AI? And I'm going to do that by saying, what does the media mean when they say AI? Um, I think what I've done here is I've taken 10 articles from the uh, news the other week and I've looked at what they actually mean, what, what these articles are writing about when they use the term AI. And um, 20% of them were looking at different types of AI and how artificial intelligence is made up of more than one thing, which is a nice because that's kind of my thesis here. 10% um, of them were looking at rule-based systems. Um, I would, Just as an aside, I would imagine if you were to do the same survey 10 years ago, they would almost all be rule-based systems. Um, but now, the vast majority of things that people mean when they're using the term AI, what they mean is machine learning. And um, I think it's worth, at this point, taking a bit of a digression into definitions. Um, and quite often, what you'll hear 
when people talk about AI is a distinction between weak AI and strong AI, sometimes known as narrow AI and strong AI. Um, narrow AI is solving specific problems. It's taking a particular task and doing it well. Um, sometimes this is referred to as task-based AI or non-sentient AI. And my kind of strap line for this is that weak AI is robots taking our jobs. Um, strong AI is all about general intelligence and things that can handle all situations in the same way that we can. And uh, my strap line for this is robots taking over the world. Um, and bearing these in mind, I think a lot of the stuff that people mean when they're saying AI is they're talking about weak AI, they're talking about narrow AI, and they're talking about specific problems, and they're also talking about taking a machine learning approach to specific problems. One of the things that we do when we process information is we go from some kind of sensory perception, some kind of model, um, some kind of input data, be it a noise or uh, something that we see, um, and we go from that and we come up with some kind of classification or an idea about what we're seeing. And with machine learning, what we're trying to do is exactly the same kind of thing, but we're inside the computer. So you get your input data, and that goes through the computer, and then it's classified as something. In the same way that we'll hear a noise, and it'll go into our auditory system, and it'll, that'll auditory system, and that will come up with some kind of idea. So, um, in a sense, uh, what I'm saying is that a lot of the time, when people talk about AI, they're talking about machine learning, and they're talking about narrow AI. And this is where I bring in my second big buzzword of the talk, and that is big data. Um, and a lot of people are saying that big data plus machine learning is what's going to give us actual artificial intelligence a lot of the time. I think there's a lot of hype going on here, but I think there's a little bit of a grain of truth inside the hype as well. So I'm going to introduce to you my test set now, which is a bunch of cute robots. Um, and I'm going to use these as examples when I'm talking about machine learning. And whilst I'm representing these as pictures, Actually, what I want you to think of is those bits, pieces of data. So they, they could be pictures, or they could be uh, features that we've extracted from these pictures. So we might say, um, this robot here has got three legs and it's got four bottles on it, and it hasn't got any aerials. And this robot here has got two legs and three buttons on it, and it has got one aerial. Um, they're obviously different colors. But what, with, what I'm thinking about here is using these robots as kind of abstract ideas that we're classifying rather than as pictures. Um, so let's take a look at machine learning in a little bit more depth. Um, broadly speaking, what we're trying to do is find patterns in data. You've got a lot of data, you've got a lot of different pictures of robots, so you've got a lot of different measurements of robots, and what you want to do is find patterns in these such that when you see a new robot, you're able to say something about that new robot. Um, and the patterns could be based upon the most obvious characteristics, so it could be based on colour, or it could be based upon other characteristics. And deciding what's important, working out what parts of your feature space are important, is a very key part of AI and a difficult thing to do a lot of the time. It's one of the difficult questions that you have to address. Um, some algorithms will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Some of them you have to specify which things you're interested in. Um, so here we've got a decision boundary that says that this side of the decision boundary we've got two-legged robots, and this side of the decision boundary we've got robots with an odd number of legs. Um, we could have a different type of fine-grainedness, so we could say we're interested in three classes here, based upon the number of legs of the robot. The other thing you might want to do is look at a more generic way of looking at these things. But let us now look in a bit more depth at a particular type of learning system and what I'm talking about here is a learning system that's known as the nearest neighbor classifier. This is something that is used quite heavily in computer vision and in a number of other systems. So um, we've got a labeled set of training instances here. So these are the robots that we've got labels for. There's a bunch of them labeled A, there's a bunch of them labeled B. And what we're going to do is we're going to use these as our training data. So this is the data that we're working from. We've got a test instance. This is a robot that we haven't seen before. Um, what we need to do is get, decide whether this robot that we haven't seen before is an A or is it, is it a B. And the way we do this 
is that we find the closest member to our test robot in the set that we've got here and the closest one to this in this set is this robot here and if you look it's got one aerial it's got three buttons on its chest its arms are in the same position it's really a very close match however it's got a different colour but there's definitely the closest match in this data set and once we've decided which is the closest you assign the label of that one that's the closest to the new data and there you've got a new data point in your data set so this gives us a new B robot in our data set this example is quite straightforward but it's also cleverer than you think and we do this kind of reasoning ourselves all the time so if you're looking to build maybe an email spam detector you say does it look like spam we've seen before or does it look more like ordinary messages so you've got two classes you've got spam and you've got not spam and you compare the incoming messages to the spam set and the not spam set and you decide which it is depending on which entry is closest yeah um, doctors will use this kind of reasoning so if you've got a set of symptoms the doctors will look at these and find a match to a particular disease based on things they've seen before and quite often if we're stuck on a particular problem or we've got a difficult question we're trying to answer one of the things we might do is look back and think um, when did I see something like this before what solution worked before and you've, by ma matching the problem to things that we've seen that are similar we can then reuse solutions that have worked in the past um, this simple example is also hiding a lot of questions so how do we determine which robot is nearest how do we determine which solution is nearest how do we determine which symptoms are a best match for the current symptoms um, for this we need some kind of space so we need to be able to have an idea of what is nearer to what to wh which parts of the space are nearer to other parts of the space and we also need a distance measure so we can compare things and actually know which is closest how we determine which aspects of our problem are important is another question that's hidden by this so that could be down to feature selection so we might decide that certain aspects of the problem are not interesting so we might say colour is irrelevant uh, we're only interested in the robots you know, the number of functions it's got um, and finally if we've got millions of examples how do we search and that's something I'm really going to skirt over here but with nearest neighbour method, so this kind of method, that's one of the really big questions. Um, here's a very rough overview of machine learning as a concept. Um, and we're going to talk through this by saying this is the input, the training data, is what we know about the problem. This is a lot of examples which may or may not be labelled. And we put these into some kind of learning algorithm. And the learning algorithm will take these examples and it will come up with some means of representing these and that is what we call a model and that is the machine learning aspect of what we're doing next when we've got a new piece of data so you've got a new instance that you want to apply your learn model to you match that to the model that you've got and by finding the closest one you get a result in the example we've just seen in the nearest neighbor example the training data is the model so there isn't really much machine learning going on at all and all of the computational work, all of the heavy lifting is finding the closest one from the data that you've seen so all of the computational work is in the matching function <coughs> when you're doing machine learning there's a real trade-off between models that are slow to learn but very quick to match and models that are very quick to learn and that are very slow to match um, so um, the, word, the word model is probably the most overloaded term in computer science. Um, in machine learning it could be a neural network, it could be a set of data as we've just seen, it could be some kind of statistical function based upon the data that you've learned, it could be a kind of embedding in a different space so you could convert your data into something which makes matching easier or separates the classes more easily. It could be a set of rules, so it could be a collection of if statements um, it could be a decision tree or a set of decision trees which is called a forest um, and as I mentioned just now sometimes the models are easy to match but take a very long time to learn and sometimes models are quick to learn but the matching process itself is where the heavy lifting is like in the example we've just seen um, I'm going to now give a quick overview of some different types of machine learning system 
a very quick high level overview just so you get a feel for the kinds of questions that you can ask. So um, with unsupervised machine learning you don't have labels so you've got a set of robots and you don't know what each class is but what you try and do is organize them so that you can get classes emerging from the data and you're looking for how the things are grouped with unsupervised machine learning and the grouping is dependent upon the spaces and the features that you measure but basically you're asking the data to kind of organize itself with supervised machine learning you've got classes and the example we've just seen is an example for supervised machine learning um, with statistical machine learning in the supervised framework what you're looking at is finding a decision boundary a way of representing the space that maximizes the difference between your classes so you've got a decision boundary which says everything to one side of this is class A and everything to, every, well, everything to the other side is class B and what you're trying to do is maximize this gap between the two which we can sometimes call a margin neural networks are a very up-and-coming type of machine learning system and I say up-and-coming in a kind of ironic way because neural networks seem to be the up-and-coming type of machine learning system um, every 20 years or so um, they get they become very fashionable and then they fall out of fashion when there becomes a class of problems that they can't handle um, and at the moment there don't seem to be any problems they're not handling very well indeed with the latest incarnations um, so I'm going to give a quick overview of them because they really are in the ascendant at the moment uh, with, with a neural network system you have a set of input neurons or input nodes uh, which encode the data that you're looking at you have links which connect nodes between layers so this is a fully connected network every input node is connected to all of the nodes on the next layer links have an associated weight and these weights determine how much of the input goes forward to each of the next loads on, nodes on the next layer so a different proportion of the input goes forward to each of the nodes on the next layer you have an output layer which has the same number of nodes as there are classes in the problem so let's say we're looking at our robot classification task again this would be an A, this would be a B maybe um, and in the hidden layer which is the one in between your input and your output this is kind of where the magic occurs this is what integrates up across the inputs um, sends information forward to the output such that it makes a sensible decision when you're training your neural network what you're doing is you're altering the weights so you present your training data to the input layer and you percolate forward to the activation and you work out whether the answer was right or wrong if the answer was right you strengthen the links that led to it if the answer was wrong then you weaken the links that led to it and this is known as back propagation because you're propagating the errors back through the network and after many iterations of this you end up with a network that's able to give the right answer based upon the training data then you get your new data and you present that to the input layer activation is fed forward to the hidden layer uh, which is fed forward again to the output layer and that gives you a decision about what the class of the input layer is and what you're doing is the network, the network has learned a mapping from inputs to outputs that is a representation or a model even of what's going on up until recently neural networks have been really good at a particular subclass of problems um, however there's been a real renaissance in neural methods and methods inspired by neural networks in the last five years or so and this is largely down to GPUs thank you computer gamers for driving this particular technological development um, because with a lot of GPUs what you can do is you can do a lot of processing of simple calculations very quickly and this has enabled the building and the training of neural networks which have got many many layers tens or hundreds of layers and these combined with very big data sets are giving some really stunning results on a lot of problems that have previously been seen as largely intractable um, this example here this image I have at the bottom is from Google's Inception Neural Network Architecture um, which is a vision architecture 
that combines a feed-forward network with pooling and convolutional layers which gives you really state-of-the-art at the time. These things move very quickly. Performance on visual classification techniques. So deep. this is known as deep learning or um, convolutional neural networks and these seem to be currently winning the AI thing and particularly in vision. So what is AI? Uh, this has been a very, very rapid overview of AI, particularly looking at machine learning. Um, but to summarise, I say that AI is finding patterns in data, it's drawing conclusions from data, so it's taking lots of data and working out what you can conclude from that in terms of classification or in terms of something else. And it's about planning actions, it's about working out what you can do next. Um, I've concentrated a lot on machine learning and neural techniques in this talk because they seem to be doing particularly well for a subset of problems. But there's a lot of other parts of AI and I hope that we're going to be seeing more of those as the rest of this AI Accelerator program goes on. Broadly speaking though, where AI is interesting is where computer programs can learn from what they've seen before and learn from what they've done before and use what they've seen before to come up with new ideas. That is really where things are getting intelligent.